Good evening, everybody. Um, I really am pleased to welcome you tonight to Society Robots and Us, which is a follow on from our original COVID-19 Robots and Us discussion. But we're broadening the topic a little bit more to talk about those aspects of robotics that are super important and are not necessarily linked to the current COVID pandemic, but they're topics that we still need to focus on. And indeed, our first topic was um, robotics and racism. And it was a fantastic discussion. You can see that video on the Silicon Valley Robotics YouTube and on the Citrus CPA uh, video channel. The other topic we had was killer robots. And tonight, we're going to talk about elder care. We have fantastic speakers who are real experts in this subject and who can talk about applying robotics in a range of ways to this topic. And um, for those that are asking about videos and replays, we are videoing. We might even be live streaming if you couldn't get onto the Zoom call. And we will make sure that the video is available afterwards. And um, I'm really pleased that there is so much interest in this topic because it is a it is critically important for society as our populations age and as we um, have the opportunity finally to be developing technologies as robotics is maturing enough to start to be a plausible assistive technology and i think it's really only just reaching that point now there's one other thing that i would like to say before i introduce our speakers and that is I'd like to acknowledge tonight that I am on the land of the Mawitma Ohlone tribe and they are not recognized federally as an Indian nation, but they're the first, the first peoples of the land around the San Francisco Bay Area and acknowledging the first peoples is become a custom in Australia. And if it isn't a custom here in the United States, well, maybe we can start that because it's certainly something that is worth thinking about. Now our speakers tonight, we're going to have Ken Goldberg, of course, who's the distinguished chair of uh, robotics and engineering at UC Berkeley and also leads the Citrus People and Robots Lab. We're going to be joined again by Ayana Howard from Georgia Tech. To, and Ayana's the chair of the School of Interactive Computing there, and also the founder and CTO of Xyrobotics. And we're going to be joined by Corey Kidd, who um, did his PhD at MIT in the Social Robotics Lab, where the other well-known luminaries such as Cynthia Brazil and I've been following his social robot startups since I think before I came to the US, so a long time ago. And he's currently the CEO and founder of Catalia Health, which I'm looking forward to learning more about today. And I am particularly looking forward to learning more from our penultimate speaker, Tandy Trower, who's the CEO and founder of Hoaloha Robotics, because I believe that that was the first robotics company that I was aware of that was specifically targeting elder care for the aging population. And I know you've got a lot of things to say about that, but we're going to kick off with our first speaker tonight, Dr. Corey Kidd. And over to you, Corey. All right, thank you. I'm gonna share just a few slides here while I get started and uh, give kind of a quick background and overview. So Andrew, I think the way we're gonna go is kind of a, a short introduction and open up the discussion, is that right? That's correct. All right, so you know, my background has been working at the intersection of healthcare and technology for, uh, for a long time. Back in the 1990s, I was at Georgia Tech where I started working in this area before I was even involved in robotics. Uh, there helped to build a research lab focused on what we might now call aging in place. So looking at all different sorts of, of technology uh, as is related to aging and you know, supporting all of us as we grow older and our needs change. And then about 20 years ago, uh, went back to school. So that's when I ended up at MIT in the media lab. 
and started exploring robotics as one of the interfaces that might really make a difference. Uh, so I've worked with a lot of different technology interfaces over the years. So in addition to robots, a lot of screen-based stuff, sensor-based things, you know, other things that might be in uh, a home environment in particular. And obviously, there's a lot of technology involved in that. My degrees are in you know, computer science and AI, uh, but also in psychology. And the, the key thing that I've looked at over a long period of time is really that psychological aspect of interaction. And when I think about these different interfaces and what they might be appropriate or not appropriate for in terms of interacting with an older population or really with any population is really that psychological perspective and understanding you know, what that might add or detract from a particular situation. And one of the key things that I've really been focused on for a long time is around engaging people or engaging patients over an extended period of time. And that's one of the challenges that, uh, you know, I'm sure not only all of us on this panel, but, uh, you know, many of you are interested in and, you know, the entire healthcare industry, in some sense, uh, it has been trying to tackle for decades. You know, how do we truly keep people or patients engaged in care over an extended period of time? And that's been the, the focus that I've had in evaluating these different technologies. Now, we're all sitting here, you know, spread out all across the U.S. or the world, watching each other on Zoom, which is different than, you know, had we done this uh, <laughs> six or 12 months ago, we might be all gathered in the same room having a discussion like this. And when we're face-to-face, -face, you know, we get intuitively that that's different than looking at someone on video. Psychologically, we know what, a lot about what those differences are. When we're face-to-face -face with someone, we're more engaged. We create stronger relationships that last longer and a number of other things. And when we look at these different technology interfaces from that perspective, we can understand the difference through that same lens. And the reason that I've now used robotics as an interface for people for almost two decades has to do with that psychology. And it turns out that you know, across all these different technologies, when you deliver interactions or conversations or whatever you're trying to do with a person with a robotic interface that can look at you and share space with you and use some of those social cues that people do in interaction, it turns out we get a lot of those psychological effects of face-to-face -face interaction. So that's the, the foundation of work that I've done for quite some time now uh, and is the foundation for what we're doing at Catalia Health. So Catalia Health is now about six years old we have taken this concept and are using it in chronic disease care management. And so what we do is leverage a couple kinds of technology. So robotics, of course, being a key one. The other are AI algorithms that are generating a conversation on the fly for a patient at that point in time. And we build programs around particular disease states. So I'll just give a, kind of a quick overview of what we do in these programs. And you know, we focus on being a healthcare company first. Of course, we do have uh, a number of people in the company who are building technology that we use to deliver our healthcare applications, but it's really about creating care management programs. We do some work with providers. Uh, so we're in the San Francisco Bay Area, Kaiser Permanente here is one of our customers, but most of our work is actually in the pharmaceutical world. Uh, so Pfizer is, is a customer that, uh, we have a long relationship with and are working with uh, their patients across a number of different disease states. And so from a patient perspective, if they're on a certain drug, they are offered our program or one of our robots that uh, is shipped directly to their home at no cost to them. And so from a patient perspective, this is a device that sits in their home that they can talk to every day. Uh, and most of our patients do talk to their robot every day or two. And it's essentially an extension of their care team. So information is going back to the pharmacist or to the doctor, to the human who's providing care. And we're able to extend the reach from what is typically now a program where the patient might get one call a month or less to something where they can interact 24 seven and really whenever they need to. And so that's really how we build these applications. And the robot itself is designed to be cute and approachable. We brought in IDO, the big design firm, uh, one of the early investors in Catalia Health to do the design with us. Uh, very simple, intuitive interface, very easy for any patient to use. The setup process is take the robot out of the box and plug it in. 
everything else is through conversation from there. Uh, and in the background, we're building up a model of each patient from a few different perspectives, but mostly medically, you know, where are they in terms of their treatment journey? And psychologically, how do we really adapt the conversation to that patient to make sure we're effective at engaging them over time? Now, the concept of doing something like this with technology isn't new. We've tried to uh, build and deploy apps or websites or other applications for decades now to try to do things like this. And typically success has been measured in weeks or you know, if you're really good in months, we've had patients on our programs for years now, which is really you know, what we focus on doing successfully and where this kind of a program makes a difference. So I'm going to pause there. Uh, it's, you know, video never works particularly well over Zoom, so I'm not going to do that. Uh, you know, our website, CataliaHealth.com, is easy to find if you want to go find a video afterwards to see what one of these looks like. Uh, but I look forward to the questions and discussions after uh, three more interesting introductions here. So thanks. Well, that's wonderful. Thank you very much, uh, Corey. If I'll, thank you. You're very much um, experienced with Zoom. And I'm quite fascinated by the intersection that Catalia Health plays between the rise of telemedicine and, you know, you're ahead of that curve for sure, and the intersection with elder care, which I hadn't really considered initially until I was looking again at some of the pictures of some of your patient trials where it is plausible. It, it, seems only logical that you're having to work with a lot of people who have reached the you know over 60 age group and is that a, a large demographic for the people that you work with specifically more often than not it really depends on which disease state you know we're working across a number of different areas uh, one of our biggest areas of work is in oncology and that uh, for the particular areas that we're in does tend to skew older um, you know, we're doing a lot of work with heart failure patients. Unfortunately, that's becoming a younger and younger disease. I think our average patient is in their 50s now. Uh, but, uh, you know, the age range that we've worked with in terms of adults is 18 to 104 years old. Uh, and generally, when we talk about chronic disease, which is where we focus, it definitely tends to, uh, to be the over 65 population. Wow, 104 years old, that is got to be a milestone for working with robots as well. Uh, and she had great stories. <laughs> I'm looking forward to talking a little bit more about this, but I would like to introduce our next speaker, Ayana Howard, and I'm definitely looking forward to hearing more from everybody today. Over to you, Ayana. All right, so let's share my screen. All right, so just a few slides for introduction. Um, so one of the interesting things is that most of the research that I have focused on has um, engaged with children, uh, children with uh, disabilities, primarily motor disabilities. Uh, but interesting enough, a, a lot of the techniques that we have designed and developed uh, apply to uh, older adults. And the reason is because um, there, when you're working with um, a group that there's not a lot of uh, data for that are considered vulnerable populations, uh, you have to um, design solutions a little bit differently. And so what my group has looked at is how do you bring in robots to do therapy or rehabilitation, so movement exercise, uh, that incorporates things such as uh, human modeling, understanding emotions, or at least the emotional state, um, be designing the robot so that they emote in, in an equivalent manner and, and things like that. So I just want to talk about two uh, projects that uh, kind of uh, show those, those attributes um, in general. Um, and so two of the studies that we focus on in terms of older adults and populations, one has been with um, dementia patients and the other is with stroke recovery patients. And so why is a robot good? Well, one of the things about a robot is that it has some of the same functionality as a human in terms of movements. Uh, so we use humanoid robots. Uh, for adults, we use Pepper. For kids, we do not. Uh, we use a smaller platform, but for adults, we use uh, Pepper, which has uh, the right size in terms of height, um, has enough articulation, 
to get individuals to exercise. And so one of the studies, uh, recent studies about um, a year and a half ago was, could we um, get individuals to exercise such that their heart rate was kept at a certain zone um, in terms of, of exercise? And so the way that we did that is we looked at, uh, we actually designed a heart rate monitor that stuck on the ear so that it wouldn't impede progress. Um, and we changed the exercise to elevate the heart rate. And when it got too high, we would change the exercise so that it would decrease. Um, in, in order to keep it in the zone of operation. Um, and so that was basically using a robot to um, encourage exercise uh, in the home environment. Although we didn't test it in the home environment, uh, the goal is uh, to uh, implement it, not in the clinic, but in the home environment. So again, those are the kinds of things that we do in using robots to engage individuals in exercise. So it's fun, it's engaging, it's exciting. Um, but at the end of the day, we are also providing a benefit with respect to movement exercise. The other thing that links to this, uh, and we also do this with kids, is I had mentioned that we look at the emotional state of uh, the individual in order to um, determine engagement level, to determine frustration, uh, whether they're excited about the interaction or not. Um, especially with dementia patients, we also want to be able to identify things such as frustration, um, confusion uh, as they're interacting with the robot. And so just like with kids, uh, we have found that a lot of the AI systems that are out there have bias against uh, older adults. Uh, so a lot of the things that you have seen uh, out in, in society, they uh, a lot of times do not include the fact that there is bias against older adults. And so we did a recent study to look at facial recognition technology to see how well some of the major AI systems do in recognizing older adults um, exhibiting different emotions. Uh, we had done this uh, a few years ago with kids and, you know, of course it didn't do that well. Uh, it does really well with like that 18 to 50 year old, uh, but older adults, it, it pretty much, um, doesn't do as well. I won't say it fails, it, it does recognize, but not at the same recognition or accuracy level. Um, and if you look at things like specificity and, and recall and all the other parameters you use to evaluate AI, uh, it doesn't do as well either. Um, and so this is kind of uh, what we're also looking at in my group is how do you create these AI systems that are interacting with older adults such that we can mitigate some of the biases that are in there. And some of the reason is because, again, the, the, the data that you're training on, um, there's not a lot of diverse data sets that have older adults in them. Uh, and so it, it makes sense why some of these systems don't work. Uh, and so this is really what we think about. And as uh, our demographics age, uh, it becomes even more concerning given that we are deploying these systems out there without sufficient data or really thinking about the fact that older adults are part of the population as we, we design these robotic systems for, for their care uh, in the future. Um, and so that's really just two of the different projects uh, as, a, as a sampling of some of the work we do uh, with robots in elder care. It's great that you are actually looking at this comparatively as well and being able to see how some technology, some approaches uh, technological approaches are inadequate when it comes to youth or age and um, you've identified lack of good data sets I'm sure I'm going this is going to be a problem across the board are there some uh, attempts to to change that um, so there are some attempts to increase uh, the data set diversity. Um, unfortunately, there's not a lot that's looking at uh, age bias, um, which is interesting and surprising. Uh, so the, the dominant ones are, of course, gender and race ethnicity. Very little done about the fact that we have these two extremes, very young and older. Uh, that are also um, not part of the different data sets. Well, it's fascinating that that hasn't really emerged because the impression that I think many of us get is that um, elder care is, I think, every funding body's favorite application of robotics. 
Um, it, it seems to range from things like uh, some of the X prizes to some of the other challenges have been publicizing the fact and targeting on the fact that we have uh, aging populations and robotics are considered to be a cure in a manner of speaking. And yet it seems to be not at all well thought out. You raised another point as well that stood out to me and it was when you were talking about robots that were emoting. And this is another thing that I think is really fruitful in terms of working with robotics, but is also really misleading for people who hear the phrase emote and can confuse it with robots having emotions or detecting emotions. And I know there are a couple of firms that that uh, suggest that this is possible, which is completely not possible and um, at this point, as best as I can see. And yet it doesn't mean that you can't design behaviors appropriate to emotions. And um, it, it sounds to me like that's the, that's the approach that you're taking. Robots are not uh, detecting emotion necessarily, but they're able to behave appropriately. Yeah, so, um, and this is the, the, the fine art. What we're looking at is detecting uh, facial expression that we are then defining related to an emotion. Um, and so, you know, we say causation versus correlation. Um, if I am expressing, if I'm smiling, it doesn't necessarily mean that I'm happy. Uh, and so that's really that, that disconnect. Like inside, I might be happy, that's my emotion, but my facial expression might not exhibit that happiness. It might be that I'm smiling because I'm really upset and I don't know how to show that I'm angry. Um, and so there's some disconnect. And so one of the things that we do and we think about, especially those who work with uh, this area of emotion is that it's not just an instantaneous time, it's, it's mm -hmm. the behavior. It's uh, if I'm exhibiting the emotion and the robot does something and you're not getting the corresponding expected behavior, then that means that you have something off and you have something wrong. Uh, and so you have to adapt based on that. Um, and so it's just the data point. It's not an absolute. Uh, that's a great way of um, explaining that more thoroughly. So there's um, an awareness of cues and of context as well. And I think uh, this is clearly an area where robots are not great at um, being engaging over a long period of time and yet trust and that kind of rapport is considered um, I guess essential to um, for robots in our uh, to embed in our lives um, I, I'm I think we're going to come back to this topic, especially as we get some questions from the audience. So I'm really pleased that we're able to um, to dive in. Uh, I should uh, ask Tandy to um, share some more about what he's working on and Hawaloho Robotics, which I think I'd better spell out again. Um, the That's website right. in the chat. I'll do it. Okay. <laughs> Let's see. I just need to figure out how to share my screen here. Let's see. Okay, can you see that? Yes, we can. Okay, good. Well, let me let me start there since you uh, ask about that. So th this helps with the spelling of the thing because one of the frequent things I've, I'm often asked is, what the heck, where, where did you get the name of the company? What, what does that have to do with robots? And hoa is actually a Hawaiian word that uh, uh, translates loosely to good friend. If you're familiar with the Hawaiian language, often words have a very rich meanings, and so they're not easily translated. But this is like a good friend, a good buddy, or like your, your best friend. Uh, and that really communicates what our, our, our goals are for, for the company. Um, there are not, actually, I, I almost objected to, to being invited to this meeting because we are not about elder care robots. We are about seniors. Uh, and I have a particular bias because I, I'm officially in that category myself these days. Uh, we're about delivering a kind of platform, though, that does address 
the challenges that seniors have uh, as they age in that they're, uh, we're not only seeing going to encounter an unprecedented number of seniors, partly fueled by my generation, the baby boomers, we're gonna be one of the largest influencers of that, but also by the fact that people are enjoying greater longevity. And even during this current crisis that we have where the senior population is still significantly expanding, that's not a bad thing. Uh, the problem is though, as, as we age, we tend to require more assistance from the resources around us. And the reality is, is that the, uh, the resources that are available to us is actually shrinking at the same time. So our goal is to try to build a platform Call it a robot that kind of bridges the gap between the growing number of seniors that we have throughout the world as well as the, the available human resources to pro provide for them. So as I said, we are not about elder care. We are about, because we believe that that elder care is best left in the hands of uh, humans uh, because we can't create robots that are that good yet. Uh, and so they may be useful and assistive but we kind of want to build the gap, so, so, so fill the gap between that. Um, as I said, we're motivated by what some people, I don't really like this term, but some people refer to as the silver tsunami. Uh, I think that's, that's somewhat of a negative term, but I do use it sometimes just to illustrate the point that if we look across the world, we're really looking at an enormous expansion of our senior population. And over the next couple of decades, as you can see here, we're gonna see a significant increase uh, worldwide, particularly the, the countries that are most affected are Japan and Western Europe. If you look at these numbers, it's just incredible to me to think that uh, over the next couple of decades, you could be walking down the street we can, we, when we can all walk down the streets together uh, in Japan and that literally you, every fourth person that you may see on the street may be a senior at that point. And uh, the numbers in China, while not as high a percentage, are incredible because what we're seeing there is if you took the total U.S. population living right now, all ages, that is the size that the Chinese senior population will be. And you can see here that over worldwide, the, the H, uh, WHO has predicted uh, over a billion seniors. In the US, it's not quite as dramatic in that we're not seeing as large a percentage, but it's still very significant. 77 million baby boomers who are aging at, into the senior ranks at 10,000 a day. And so that means uh, we're going to have a very significant number. Uh, it's now estimated to be 15 to 20 percent of our total population. Now, I think it's wrong to assume that all those seniors are going to be old and feeble people. I think that's an old, uh, that's a, that's a, uh, smacks of ageism and a incorrect view. I mean, speaking as a representative of that community, I am not looking to be taken care of, at least not at the current point in my life right now. But there are many things that I can use technology for that allow me to maintain my independence. And that's really what we're focused on. The robot that we're building is a physically embodied uh, entity. Unfortunately, I'm not going to be able to show you it today. We're still keeping it in a veil of secrecy at the moment. But I can tell you that it's, it's, uh, it's, not, a, it's not a small robot. Uh, it stands a little over a meter tall. It's about half a meter in diameter. And it, it moves around with you. It moves through the space with you. Uh, it does not have legs. I, I will tell you that. It, it is on a, a wheeled mobile bed, powered mobile base but it is able to move omnidirectionally throughout the environment that it's operating in. That means it can't do stairs, so it's not something like the Honda Asimo, but uh, we believe that in the situations that we're targeting for, many people, uh, even in my current living situation, even though I have no disabilities, uh, prefer to live kind of stay at a, a single level in a home. And because of that is autonomously mobile, uh, it can, uh, charge itself. So it's basically uh, another entity to live in your house. So um, our user experience is one of the major factors that we're focused on. We believe very strongly in the importance of the engagement that the users have 
with our robot. And so we're working on, we're building a, what we would call a conversationally social paradigm. Uh, others may know of this, but I would differentiate it from the kinds of interaction that you have today with something like an Amazon Echo, where you basically ask a question or make a request and you're done. Uh, that's not our goal. We're not trying to be a knowledge oracle. Uh, our robot's design is really to engage with you in casual conversation over a variety, top, a variety of things, maybe a smaller set of things that you could ask Alexa about, but in a more depth with it. So for example, if you were to ask our robot for the weather, it's likely to engage with you and say, well, would you like to have the temperature in Celsius? Or it might ask a question like, do you like the weather? And it's, it may ask you that uh, several times during, not at the same time, but over your period of engagement with it to try to build a learning model so it understands what you like about weather, whether you like it, it's a good day or a bad day for you in terms of the weather. Um, so its whole interface is designed to be very natural and very conversationally interactive. But not just through speech, we support interaction also through the, as Corey's robot does, we have a touch screen as well, and that also supports interaction as well. Um, our value proposition is not based on manipulation. The robot is not your servant. It is not your little housekeeper. It's not your Rosie. We're not there yet. I don't believe anybody's quite there yet. We'll have to see what Ken has cooking up his sleeve here, but I don't believe anybody is fully quite to that stage. So we build it out of uh, scenarios that can provide value to the user and you can see them listed here. So I won't uh, reiterate all of them, but you can see that one of them is to facilitate communication between from person to person. And we think that's very essential for our target audience. One of the greatest dangers of having a senior population is the fact that uh, they are susceptible to social isolation. And if you want to, if you want something that's as bad as smoking several packets of cigarettes, uh, isolate yourself socially. So we're very sensitive to the current COVID crisis and, and the impact it's having right now. And we see our robot as having a major, a potential major impact to, to overcome the, the, the drawbacks of that. Again, one of its scenarios though is companionship. It is kind of your little buddy. It's not your, again, it's your not your healthcare worker, it's your little buddy. Uh, it's your companion, it's your friend, it's someone you can talk to uh, and also, but it will remind you about, you know, interactions that you might want to have with other people. Uh, they want to tell you, remind you that you need to talk, uh, set your appointment coming up for your doctor, or you might want to call your son-in-law, or it can also act coming the other way as a uh, administrative assistant to support having other people set up conversations with you. So again, our scenario is not about care. I mean, care is a part of it, but it, our care for us is like, is your mobile phone a care device? Sure, it can have health. Uh, it can help you track your health and wellness. It can have applications that perhaps are useful for you that way, uh, but you wouldn't think of it as taking care of you. It is a device that empowers you. It's a device that augments you. It's a device that gives you greater capability. Like I think, for example, like I, I have a number of people on my, on my mobile phone of which have email addresses and phone numbers that I do not try to retain in my brain. But my phone acts as a cognitive augmentation device. And the last thing I say is that we believe that all of this and everything you're hearing today and the progress that we're making is moving the whole, our whole interaction with technology, shifting it from technology as tools where we just tell these tools what to do and they become active collaborators. And this kind of interaction that we've been talking about so far through all the speakers, including myself, I think is representative of move a trend in that direction where we don't think of technology just as a screwdriver, but it actually presents itself. It helps us and understands and adapts to who we are in a very natural way, interacting with us in a natural way so that we can be greater than we are individually by ourselves. That's all. <laughs> it's so much in, in that um, 
talk really. And I think the stories that have come out of care facilities, not, not simply aged care, but all of the hospitals during the COVID crisis have shifted communication from being something that we don't pay a lot of, we don't really spend much attention thinking about that to being something that is now, we're well aware of the role that it can play to see so many people deprived of communication with their loved ones because of quarantine is just has to my mind at least it's moved this from not being a consideration at all to being one of the critical things that we really really do have to improve and um, so I appreciate, I'm very pleased that you didn't take too much issue to me calling this aged care or elder care <laughs> and came on to share that perspective because I have to say, I didn't quite realize, um, I'm absolutely a baby boomer too. I thought I was a Gen Z or something, Gen X, but I, I'm clearly wrong. I'm totally there and uh, in the senior demographic, I guess. And uh, Ken, that's a slight segue. I. I think perhaps a number of us on this call are a little closer to the silver tsunami than <laughs> I think we personally identify with. So yes. it's very I'm, not gonna, I'm not ready yet, but uh, thank you for that. <laughs> um, okay, well, I, I really appreciate the context and I'll share my screen here. Um, this I have a few slides. Let's see, are they visible? Yes, aging population, oh. 1990. Great, okay, good. So I, I, I wanna echo exactly what Tandy was talking about, just uh, from one more perspective, which this is a, a slide that I made up in, to, to illustrate the, the aging population uh, demographic that he's talking about, namely that around 1990, we had about six people working for every one person who was retired. And, and um, in, in 2000, that's shrunk to about four people working for every one person retired. And in 2025, at least in Japan, um, as, 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 as Tandy alluded, we're gonna be down to two people working for every one person retired. So, and this is not a speculation. It's not some sort of um, wild prediction. This is actually the demographics. It's, a, it's, it's something that's inevitable given the, 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 what we know of the age of the population and how it's evolving. So this is, this is a huge issue. And all this was, this, this tidal wave was basically moving toward us even before COVID-19 struck. And I, I'm fascinated by, 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 by you know, the, the immense changes, how unexpected this was and how much has changed all of our expectations and, and, and plans. It is going to shift these demographics in, in, in ways that we still don't know. It probably, you know, it is going to, to have substantial impact. And one of them is that it's putting a lot of um, seniors into a position where they don't want to um, leave their homes. And in particular, they also don't want necessarily to have caretakers come to their homes. And they certainly don't want to go into retirement centers. I think that's, that's increasingly clear. So the question is, how, how can, can, can we assist in some ways with technologies, as, as we've been discussing, Ayana and Corey? Um, and what I, I, one thing that I just want to point out, it's been around for a long time. I remember my grandparents uh, 20 years ago had a device like this where they had a, a, a tele service where they would take their blood pressure and vital signs, um, their temperature, et cetera, and they would report it all through the phone. And this would, uh, there was a nurse that would track this information and it was really helpful because they could get updates every single day and then they could, if they had um, concerns about their medicines or anything, there was someone there to check in on them every day and get some, some live information. And uh, it's, it's a far cry from what Tandy is envisioning where there's a real companion that's with them all the time. Now, that is really the, the I, I would say, the, the interesting frontier, which is, wouldn't it be nice if, you know, during the day you have a situation like this um, in the morning, and then, you know, an hour or two later, the robot uh, has cleaned everything up. That's the holy grail. And I would have to say there's a film, Robot and Frank, which is one of my favorite films that is a uh, set in the 
what they call as the near the near future. It's where a robot is basically sent in to assist a cranky senior gentleman um, who is um, Franco Angela. And it's a it's a wonderful film because he really doesn't want the robot in a way that I could relate to. And then he gradually becomes friends with the robot. And I won't give away the plot twist. It's really, really interesting and, and, and quite funny. Um, now, this is, you know, this, this has sort of been viewed as a state of the art. This is a uh, Toyota actually is coming out with a, um, uh, that has this robot um, called the human support robot. And uh, this is a uh, one version of a system that's set up to, to do some cleaning, some tidying of the house. And by the way, uh, Steve Cousins had pointed out that it's very important to pick things up off the floor because that is seniors are very prone to, um, to, to injury if they step on something and fall. So just keeping the floor clean is a very valuable um, service. And we're not talking about a, a Roomba, which, which you know, sweeps the floor, but we're talking about something that can tidy the floor and put things away. So this was an effort that was, um, that was done in Japan. And then this is the effort that is in our, our lab at, at Berkeley. We've been doing something very similar and trying to, in this case, it's automated uh, analysis of the objects and then classifying them. And it's also the challenge of being able to pick up, to grasp um, unusually shaped objects and then put them away into bins. And it's not going to be perfect. It's going to be um, mistakes. It's going to put things in the wrong bin and, uh, and drop certain objects. But this system was able to, to successfully, over time, with a few retries, uh, to be able to clear the floor in, um, in a consistent way. Now, I want to not spend the rest of my time see, focusing on a, a different problem. And this is, um, this is something I think many of us can relate to, which is um, bed making. And this is, uh, this, is, um, this is an interesting challenge for, for robots. And it's important because nobody really likes making their bed, as uh, my daughters can attest. Um, and challenging, it's also challenging for, for anyone with um, limited mobility or dexterity. And so that is seniors who can be prone to, to back injuries. And, um, and also, I think that this is something that's suitable for home robots, that we can actually get there. It's um, because it doesn't have to be perfect. You don't have to make the bed uh, perfectly. It's tolerant to error. And it's also not time critical. It doesn't have to be done um, usually under enormous time pressure. It's just important that you get it done before you go to bed the next night. So we've been actually developing a prototype of this and working with Honda um, on a research project using different robots. And the idea is how to find the, the pick points. In other words, how to the robot has to control to find out where to pick the blankets up and how to move them in order to, to, to make a bed. So this is a quarter size bed that we developed in the lab. And uh, I want to give credit to, to Daniel Sita and other students in my group. Um, there's a fair amount of, of related work, as, as I think most are aware on this, um, on this Zoom call, in uh, for roboticists developing things like um, folding laundry. Peter Beale's group did really interesting work on that a few years ago and other areas where it's trying to manipulate fabrics and cloth. This is now heated up again because of deep learning. There's a lot of new excitement about the new techniques uh, for, for achieving this. The, the task in our case was to, to, to look at the bed and determine where to, where to grasp and then how to pull the, um, the blanket. Now, one thing we made use of is depth cameras. And the nice thing about depth camera is it gives you a instantly a very nice uh, depth perception of the of the scene and then allows you to um, um, and, and then we can learn from lots of examples so just to go very quickly we have a deep network that essentially looks at lots of beds um, from lots of states of the bed you know from using the depth camera and then it's able to essentially um, self-learn by we, we put a marker on the corner and it sees that moving in many different environments and then it starts to learn to generalize to a new configuration of the beds basically find the corner. Now here's a comparison of the robot system versus a human. Um, and the, what you're seeing here is that the robot is, um, humans are very good. They all, the, the start is on the left and then the, the, um, the, the, the end is on the right. So they're almost always able to rapid, radically increase the coverage of the bed. Um, but um, with an analytic model, we're able to get the robot to do this um, somewhat well as, uh, as well. They're able to get about 80% of the bed covered. 
And when we learned um, with deep learning, we were able to show that the system, this is with two different robots, is able to actually um, get very comparable to human performance in making the bed. And we also were able to transfer this to new blankets. So in other words, blankets with patterns, very different col colors than what was trained on. Again, because it's using depth, it doesn't, it, it basically it ignores the colors and, um, and patterns on the fabric. So it's not particularly fast. It takes about so, something on the order of uh, an hour <laughs> right now um, because it's, it's processing very slowly. But you can see here that it's, um, it's able to start to make progress. And this is the other um, system. The other idea is that we can generalize to different robots because we've learned essentially the pick points on the bed. Now, I don't have time to go into all the details, but there's a couple of papers on this on our website at uh, automation.berkeley.edu. And then I'll leave you with the last thing, which is uh, a very exciting new robot uh, hardware platform that was announced just about two weeks ago from a company called Hello Robot. And you can see it here. What I like about it is it's fairly low cost. I mean, it's not down to what we want, which is about you know two under under three thousand dollars. But it's an elegant design. It moves around. And what I particularly want to emphasize here is the potential for teleoperation. Could this be, it's, I think that most of us will agree that it's not ready to work autonomously in a home, but the idea of this system is that it could be teleoperated by a caretaker or a loved one who would be able to move around and be able to straighten up and assist an elder person remotely. And that would probably be safe for, for COVID-19. All right, thank you for your time. Back to you. Oh, thanks so much for bringing up uh, Hello Robot. Um, I reached out to Aaron Edsinger, but he had a clash tonight. Uh, I would love to look back at, to do these topics again, but I think it's, from what I'm learning today, we really need to, I suppose, decompose the topics into understanding companionship, context, communication, and I suppose the, the social aspects of the robot. And also the, I guess, housework and physical task areas. There are a few startups that I have seen in the last year or so that have been trying to address household tasks. And um, then there are also augmentative uh, robotic systems that we can't even call exoskeletons. It's more like powered clothing to augment uh, all of us so there's so much exciting work happening. I'm not certain how close to commercialization any of it is. And this is bringing me back to the questions. We have quite a lot of great questions there. And um, for example, Sarah, this is not so much question as it is information, is asking, is anybody leveraging the AARP innovation pitch competition or their resources. And uh, if we're not, we should be looking up AARP, I think. And uh, from IFRA, a question about what do you think the next research problem is uh, in this space? Ken, I'll ask you to, to maybe hazard a guess at the next research problem and then Ayana and Corey. Well, I should defer to 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 the others, um, Corey, Tandy, and Ayana. Um, but I, I think there's a, there's a lot of, of, of pressing problems right now. I do think that there's going to be a shift in the acceptance of robots because of COVID-19. That is very that, that seems very evident to me. I think the key is getting the cost down and being able to have the reliability sufficiently high that we can actually start to trust them. Ayana, do you have any um, thoughts about where the research topics lie? It's such a broad field. I know it's going to be tricky, but what do you think is the, the next unsolved problem? Yeah, so I actually think uh, kind of following on what Ken was saying. Um, so since I work in the space of, of individuals or working with individuals with disabilities, uh, there is a real need. Uh, so. Uh, if you think about therapy rehabilitation, uh, when we've gone into lockdown or you know clinics aren't seeing as many clients, 
the patients that go to rehab are the ones that are losing out the most because it's, it's like, oh, it's not like life saving or life critical. Uh, so I actually think that there's both an opportunity, but also a challenge of how do you provide these robotic systems, whether it's telepresence systems that can actuate in the home at a, at a low cost for uh, movement therapy. Uh, it doesn't really exist and there is definitely a need uh, that's being voiced by the community. So that would really contribute to aging in place and minimizing the cost is in, uh, as we slow down the progression deeper into the healthcare systems. And there's a question here for Corey and Tandy. Do you see your startup robots include reference from not just text and speech for answers? And I can see that this being relevant for you, Ayana, as well, uh, but also using vision, especially to deal with uncertainty involved in, um, I suppose, understanding context or privacy, or to help improve the personalized experience. So does vision play a role, or are your engagements primarily based on text and language? Oh, Tandy, you're right, I think Tandy's pointing at me while I'm mute, but uh, no. Go ahead, Tandy, unmute. Okay, you wanna, you wanna answer first then? Go ahead. Okay, well, for ours, I didn't go too much into the, the details of our experience. Again, many of the details about exactly what we're implementing, we still keep, uh, keep confidential for now. But I can tell you that uh, it's not only, speech is not the only uh, and touch is not the only form of interaction where our robot actually has several cameras on it uh, that support some of the cameras are dedicated to interaction and some of them are dedicated to navigation but when they're not supporting navigation they can be used to support interaction as well and those cameras collect a variety of different kinds of information we collect information uh, uh, like from normal cameras, like your typical RGB camera. We, so we use uh, kind of standard images. Uh, we have depth information that comes in through the robots cameras. We have infrared information that comes through and we have thermal. So, uh, because when you see a, with the, if there's a lump on the floor, well, you're gonna know if it's, uh, if it's a person or not most quickly, not just by trying to do some kind of image analysis, but if it's, if it's, it's sending out a heat signature, then you know. And actually heat, uh, the thermal sensing helps in other ways too. We know, uh, we know better if someone is talking to the robot by looking for the heat signatures because your face, regardless of how good your, your face identification and RECO is, your head track, your face tracking, uh, one, of the, one of the things that is most beneficial is to heat, see that heat signature and to know we can actually detect whether you're talking because when you open your mouth, heat comes out of your mouth and there's a quite, a, quite a heat differential that's there. So, so vision is very much a part of our overall interaction design and is, is seemed, is, is sewn into the fabric of our interaction. That's very interesting, yeah. Tandy. And you, Corey? Sure, so for us a little bit different. Speech is the primary interface uh, in both directions, the robot speaking and the patient replying via speech. Uh, we have focused on building a really low cost device so that we can get these out to a lot of patients. We only have a single camera. Uh, we're using that for kind of some basic interaction capabilities right now. You know, most of what we do with our patients on the robotic device is you know, carry on a conversation. So we'll pair that with other devices, other sensors based on a particular disease state or something we need to measure for a certain patient population, uh, but uh, largely you know, voice interaction and a little bit using the, uh, the camera on there. Yeah, I would like to add one more thing that is uh, essential in our design. Like our robot, uh, like Quarry's, they, they look quite different. You would not expect them to look like twins in the room, but they do share some com characteristics in that our robot also has a head and a face. Now, we do our head and face a little bit different than what Quarry does. And for us, um, we, 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 we try to take advantage of the entire expressions that uh, benefits that you get out of 
out of social expression. So I know Corey's has eyes and we have eyes as well. We don't do eyes quite the same way, but for us as a part of, to Corey's point, uh, to support interaction for us, it's not just that the robot speaks back audibly to you while you speak to it, or not simultaneously, but when you can speak to it and it speaks back to you, but also that the whole social engagement, and I think this is a, there's a part of this even in Corey, what Corey has developed here too, in that it's, it's not just what the robot is saying, but that the facial expressions uh, are a very, for us, are a very important part of that conversational interaction. That it's not just what we hear in our ears, uh, but what we see when we're looking at someone. So you can certainly talk to someone on a telephone where you're not seeing them, but you're losing part of the bandwidth. And when you see, when you interact with someone in person, uh, that additional feedback, like if, if I say, oh, that's great, and you see my facial expression, you interpret something very different than what my mouth would be saying. What we, Ariana was talking about the fact earlier about the fact that, uh, I think that was her, that, that you know, facial expressions uh, are not necessarily, do not necessarily reflect the reality of the emotion that you're feeling. You can, you can smile at someone when you're really angry or, or, or express emotions in very different ways. So for us in the communication channel, uh, scripting and art, articulating the, the face with, the, with what's being said is a very important part. So it's not just what the robot is seeing, but what you are seeing when the robot is interacting with you. I mean, for example, another example would be something like SoftBank's Pepper. Uh, it's these beautiful, elegant arms for gesturing. But unfortunately, its face is fairly static. They, could, they do some things with moving the heads around and lighting up the eyes. But there's, it's, that is not the way we generally interpret uh, a social facial expression. So um, it's lucky that it does have the, the, the gesturing arms because the, the face doesn't really communicate much in terms of uh, normal social communication. And those arms are very evocative. I, I know yes. a lot of the designers have had, have very much enjoyed that aspect of designing the appropriate gestures to augment the interactions. We have a couple of great questions. I hope everybody can just hang on for a few more minutes after seven to answer. Uh, Aubrey clearly is very experienced in robotics uh, and she's diving straight into details about uh, your experience as founders, finding the appropriate source of funding for your startups and um, whether you need to go what is the best approach going for um, robots direct to consumers or robots to some other agency or um, and if indeed funding source your your primary customer and people's willingness to fund that has changed over time so Corey I know you went through a real pivot over the course of a few um, uh, iterations from going directly to consumer to going to uh, pharma instead. Yeah, over a couple of companies. I mean, you know, when I started Catalia Health, the focus was really on, you know, looking at where the opportunities are in the healthcare market in the last, uh, you know, half dozen years. And so we've been focused on that from the beginning of this company. And I think one of the important points is, you know, we don't sell robots. <laughs> it's not either a part of our business model or our pitch to customers. And I think that's really critical, you know, in thinking about where you're positioning yourself in the market, it's about solving a problem for, you know, your customers or your end users. So in our case, you know, we work with providers, we work with pharma custom, uh, you know, companies, those are our customers, uh, but ultimately it's the patient that's using what we build um, you know, one you know, aspect of the business is we actually technically own all the robots that are out in our patient homes. What we are selling is a care management service. We get paid on a monthly basis for every patient that we're helping, free to the patient, uh, but fitting in with existing business models. Now, the way that those look right now are very different. It's typically nurses on phones are sending someone out to a home, but we're really fitting into what the healthcare industry is already doing and expecting 
in terms of what the, the business transaction part of it looks like. Great. Can, what can you tell us about your business model, Tandy? Um, well, we are currently self, we have chosen to be self-funded uh, because it, we prefer not to have the distraction of, of investors who are, whose primary purpose is to see a quick return on revenue. So it allows us to stay somewhat more focused about what we're trying to do and just satisfy that we are achieving the goals that we want to achieve. Uh, as far as our long-term business model, um, we see ourselves similar like as Corey does as probably offering the robot as a service because of the scale of the robot and the complexity of its, uh, if its uh, structure, it will not be cheap. Uh, I'd love to say that we could sell the robot at, uh, at the cost of a Roomba, but that's not gonna happen. Uh, there are many more components, many more sensors, uh, much more substantial batteries. The, the thing is physically more significant. Again, if you, the closest analogy might be something like SoftBank's pepper, which if you look at is actually the effective cost of a SoftBank pepper is not the $2,000 that they originally advertised because you had to buy into the subscription service, but actually the total cost of ownership ends up being more like $15,000. We don't think we'll be that expensive, but for a new product coming into the marketplace for which there are no uh, well-established priors going into the market and saying, hey, gra hey, get this for your grandma. Like I, I love that Ken talked about Robot and Frank, also one of my favorite movies. But to, to say that you're gonna buy that for your, your aging parent or, or loved one, or that they're actually, that's another comment I want to make, but I don't want to digress now, is I think we need to get away from this model to assume that it's always going to be the children's responsibility to take care of their parent. My, again, speaking as a member of that generation, I think we need to focus on the fact that we need to make, we need to make, I, I, we at, at my company feel like we need to make it attractive enough that a senior chooses to make this a part of their their life experience. And to that extent, I think robot as a service will work better because we can offer an entry level price that still allows us to, uh, uh, to cover the costs of the robot and also provides a long-term stream of, of revenue. So that's kind of our, our current thinking for our business approach. We're not out there yet, so I can't, uh, I can't give you any data on how well that model works, but it's good to hear that it's somewhat working for Corey. I've certainly yeah. seen more investors um, are comfortable with having, you know, recurrent revenue. It's a little closer to the enterprise software model that they understand. Uh, but I, Ken, do you had something to say? Just one one note on to to what Corey and, and Tandy just said, um, and it relates back to what Ayana was saying about the research questions, because I think the the hardware is a challenge. Right? There is uh, th this is. Um, Getting that cost down to the really practical value is going to be is going to be hard. One thing I have been thinking about is is the Toyota's effort because partly because Toyota knows how to make a very reliable product at a practical cost. And I remember talking to my mother, who's in her 80s now, about about this, and she said, "Oh, you know, I'd I'd buy that because she's been driving Toyotas for years. She knows that it's a trustworthy brand to her." And so she could trust instinct instinctively that company to provide a robot. And I think there's another part that actually, I think it was Steve Cousins also had pointed out years ago that at a certain age when you're essentially as a senior, you can't drive anymore and you have to give up your car. That's a very psychological moment, but it also means that suddenly that cost, which can be um, you know m multiple thousands of dollars a year suddenly is uh, re removed. And so, Maybe that's the time when you say, well, for let's say $3,000, $5,000, you would invest in a robot and it would do some tasks for you like keeping the floor clean. And ideally some aspects of these, these other aspects, the psychological companionship that we're talking about tonight. I mean, I, I'm starting, as you said, as we started out tonight, um, I'm just saying, I'm starting to see this, you know, I'm, it's not gonna be too long before I'm gonna be ready for one of these. And I'm, I, I'm thinking introspectively, like, what would I want? And I can tell you, I would rather have a robot in my home than a, uh, a healthcare worker who doesn't really want to be there. So 
I, I'm, I think there's, a, there's an opportunity. I don't think it's some holy grail that we're going to have the magical, you know, rosy, but it's going to be something that I think is going to be helpful for seniors, hopefully, in the next decade. Can I play soft, soft, uh, react to something? I, I, I like what Ken, where, where Ken was going there. I mean, because the comment I was going to offer earlier in response to the previous question, one of the previous questions you had, is one of the biggest challenges I see, uh, and it relates to what we're trying to create, is that the costs of tasks that require dexterous manipulation are just not there yet. I mean, there are a lot of things that are not there yet. Now, Ken is doing some amazing things with his students in their lab. And it's, it's great to see that. But in terms of translating that into a practical value, th there are several difficulties with any kind of tasks that require dexterous manipulation. The first is the cost of the components. And you can see that today with almost any robot on the marketplace that does have articulated arms. Like to get the kind of fine motion in the, the, the Toyota robot is a little bit different than that they've been designed it a little more simply, but if you look at like the agility robot, the Boston Dynamics robots, all these things that have very sophisticated manipulators, that's not cheap. You're talking about probably $10,000 worth of components to do one arm, and that may not even include the manipulator. So you have that cost. Then you have the cost, the, the thing that we're very sensitive to as well, is the cost of power. In, in a factory, a robot arm can work for hours because it's plugged into a constant source of, of power. But if you're running around the house, you've got to operate on batteries. And few people know that as amazing as Honda's Asimo was, when he finished his demo, he went back to the charger to get his charge to charge up. He didn't have much juice left after he was done. He didn't have that long a runtime. So you have this power balance and cost every since a typical manipulator takes six to seven uh, servos to, to give it that kind of degrees of freedom, you're talking about a lot of motors and not just motors to actuate, to, to reach out and grab something, but to hold position while you're doing that. So um, I, I've always been hopeful that perhaps the people in focusing on pneumatics or other, there might be some other cheaper way. And the reality is it's not gonna get that much cheaper anytime close because it's not a technology issue. It's not like, oh, well, if we make this chip smaller, we can get the cost down. No, the problem is motors take uh, things like rare earth magnets, that they take copper wire and those commodities, we're not, you know, we may discover some new sources of it, but those prices are not coming down anytime soon. So unless you erase that and find a new innovation way to manipulate arms, and there are people doing a variety of different things, that cost and then goes up. So you have the cost of components, you have the cost of power, then you have the, the safety issue. And fortunately in the last decade, we've seen tremendous innovation in the areas of safety so that robot arms can actually now be put side by side with people. This is a very significant thing that has happened because previously that's not been the case. But then you have the problem that Ken is working on, and I believe that's the hardest problem at all. And that is all that software, all those learning models to do very simple things like identify objects, know how to pick them up, know how to put them down, know how to hand them, know how much pressure that when you pick up an egg versus picking up uh, a rock, that, that those are different substances, you can grip them differently. That's all, that's still an area that, uh, I'm pleased to see the work that, that, that Ken is doing because that is, that will be a significant, that opens a door to, a, to the rosy and we're not there yet, so. <laughs> I, I have to agree with you, we're not there yet. And in fact, rosy is such a far point. We're working with, I believe, robots in society that can do single tasks, not multiple tasks. And that is just such a complex, Thing. Uh, this is such a great discussion. Clearly, we need to revisit it and drill in a little deeper because you've all raised so many, so many things that I would love to talk more about. And we've had great questions. Uh, can I ask you, Ayana? Do you have a, a closing thought? Your largest challenge in this field, or your greatest hope? Um. I guess is my greatest hope. I'm, I'm actually an optimist. So, um, you know, before COVID, uh, maybe a year ago, I, I remember being very um, upset because all of these robotic companies were failing, right? Like 
companies that I was like, oh, how that couldn't possibly have happened. Um, and what I am actually optimistic about, though, is that there is more of an acceptance. And I think the acceptance is coupled with this need uh, for, for robotics technologies in the home, um, with, with elder care, with individuals with disabilities, for kids, education, you name it. Uh, I think we, we, people are accepting of robots. And I actually think that the price point it's an issue, but I don't think it's as much of an issue as it was before because people understand the value that these systems are providing. Um, and, and so I'm optimistic about, about the future of, of robots for, for the home, for elder care, uh, as we, we're going to have to find a new term, uh, and things like that. Well, thank you, Ayana. I'm so pleased you're an optimist. Corey, do you have a closing thought for us? <laughs> I think it's appropriate going after Ayana. I'm, I'm also an optimist about this and, you know, excited about the opportunity right now. Um, you know, I've gotten a number of uh, messages on the chat privately that are largely on the kind of company side of things. So I'll just, uh, you know, kind of say that I think there is a huge opportunity for doing the kinds of things that all of us who are on this panel are working on. Um, I've gotten a couple of messages about hiring. Yes, we are. Go to our website. Uh, if I've missed your message, uh, I'll, I'll put my Twitter handle. That's an easy place to find me, but my email address is uh, the same at kataliahealth.com. So feel free to reach out. And uh, you know, things are really growing quickly, particularly when it comes to healthcare right now. And I think one of the things that you know we're seeing at Katalia Health, one of the uh, you know, for better or for worse, positives out of the last few months of COVID is it's really showing the need to be able to do much more with patients. Uh, remotely. And I mean, we're doing more business this year than we did in our first five years combined. <laughs> and, uh, you know, so it, it is a very exciting time for what all of us are doing. And I think that does change the conversation around price point. And, you know, I think uh, a few people have made some good comparisons. You know, it doesn't have to be, you know, a really inexpensive device. Uh, there's a, an easier entry point if it is. And I think that's where we are. Uh, but I think that we're going to see a lot of other things on the market in the next few years. So looking forward to uh, what everyone who's participating here will be working on. Those are both great points. When we've seen executive orders saying, bring in the robots, uh, please. Let's use them for health. Tandy, do you have a closing remark? And then over to you, Ken. Oh. Um, let's see. Um, I'll echo the same comment that that I don't know how you can work in the field of robotics right now, particularly in these diverse areas that robotics is moving into, like particularly with with robots, personal robots or companion robots or whatever, social robots, whatever the category is, robots that live with us. Uh, I don't see how you can work in this space without being an optimist. Uh, certainly there are negative sides of, of, of the business. We've seen a lot of companies try very hard. I mean, I've been watching, observing the industry for decades now, and the reality is it, we're not getting there real fast. I mean, the Roomba is about the best we've got right now in the home uh, in terms of something that everybody might have, but uh, it's not rosy. So we still have a long ways to go. Uh, it's a very hard, my experience is that it's a very, a much harder problem than it appears to be. It seems so simple. We see them in the movies. We read about them in the books, watch them on TV. Of course we know, we would know how a robot should operate, but actually implementing that, it's much more difficult than anyone sh can expect. And one of the problems is, is that I think it's without manipulation, it's very difficult to create a value proposition. So you have to look for things. I mean, iRobot figured it out. They figured out that just vacuum up dust bunnies was enough to get people to pay, you know, a few hundred dollars. And um, so there, there are models that you can do that, that don't require manipulation, but uh, those, those are very mm -hmm. hard to do. That's a great point. The movie industry has not really Helped us. Helped us with, <laughs> particularly with more of X paradox and understanding that. Ken, uh, where do you sit? Uh, optimistic or pessimistic? Oh, you're muted. 
and I was going to say you're in robotics, so you must be optimistic. I am an optimist. No, I, I, I really am. I, I see a huge amount of suffering out there and inequality. I think that this is very uh, huge challenges we're facing, and it's been it's been ex exacerbated by the by COVID nineteen. But I do think that it's changing. It's a wake up call on many fronts for us, as as we've discussed in um, these terrific series that you've been organizing. And I think that there's an opportunity to change the way we've been thinking. And so I think we're we're learning things about distance education, tele telehealth, and 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 I think that there is going to be a, a door open to some kind of um, system. And and one example I also mentioned that I don't think we we talked about yet was um, Alexa. Again, you know, five years ago it was we we didn't have anything like it. Now it's it's a very um, very very commonly used um, essentially companion in our home now it doesn't it doesn't move but it's it, it's remarkable how well it, it actually works and can be useful I know there's all kinds of privacy issues of course but um, I think that something like that I do hope there's going to be some kind of insight like that kind of a platform that could come out and with the right leverage um, obviously it was it was a it was sold at a loss for a long time by by Amazon because they were trying to gain market share um, and so the kind of thing could happen again where there's a robot platform and then the opportunities are there to for, for the for roboticists to develop the software and the tools and move them onto a, a platform that could be widely available and I think Ayana's point about working with with um, actually doing experiments because this is so important to really perform experiments to understand how people respond the, the HRI aspects they're very subtle and very counterintuitive in many cases. And that's where we need to be careful because I think as roboticists, we think, okay, this is what I want. But if someone is impaired and has a disability or um, you know, is, is just old, older, senior, they aren't gonna want the same things that someone who's you know, in their 20s wants. So I, we have to be thinking carefully about all of these things. And that's where I think there's great opportunity for the next, the next decade as we reach this inevitable this uh, crescendo of the uh, silver tsunami that uh, we got to get ready for it. <laughs> or the robot um, golden age of robotics may be starting now, I think, is, is the age. other way. And all the companies that survive are hiring. So also thank you for bringing that up, Corey, as well, because the opportunities for people to get involved with really exciting robotics companies, it's just, it, there's so, so many great opportunities there. It's a really exciting time to be interested in robotics. And thank you everybody tonight for raising so many interesting points. We need to revisit this topic because there's so many, and I could see in the audience, there are questions we didn't really fully get to. And I'm looking forward to continuing this discussion, but thank you all tonight for being such great speakers and sharing so much of your journeys ahead of us into developing robots that we will have in the homes, that we already have in the homes. Thank you. And good night, everybody. Thank you. Thank you. Thank Andrew. you. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you, everyone. Good night. Bye, everyone. Bye.